goodness, grace, mercy, Lord. Lord, we thank you for all good things you are doing in our life. Lord, we surrender ourselves to the word of your grace, which is able to build us, Lord. Let your will be done. Let your Holy Spirit lead us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, um, last class I have assigned some other work and then I had to attend to that. So I could not take the class. Uh, so we kind of have a break between the introduction to the epistles and this first epistle of John. Uh, so um, maybe we could just go over one or two things, you know, while we are doing uh, this uh, today's class, just as a reminder of what we had done in the intro uh, the week before last. Uh, so uh, today, uh, the hope is to cover the first and second chapters of the first epistle, the first letter of John. Uh, so if we can open up our Bibles to First John, and um, we'll, of course, begin with chapter 1. Uh, so if I, uh, oh yeah, before I do that, um, yes, regarding the assessments, um, if you remember, uh, assessment one was posted long ago, and uh, most of you have answered it. Uh, there are a few whose names I see here, you know, on my screen sometimes, uh, but they have not done the uh, first assessment. Uh, so time is kind of running out. Uh, so within the next one or two days, if you know those of you who have not been able to uh, finish the assessment, um, if you could do that, because that was just 25 questions and it should not be, it was multiple choice. So those who have not done the first assessment yet, uh, if you could kindly finish it off. Um, now regarding the second assessment, uh, that is going to be uh, much lengthier because I could only give 25 in the first one. So this will be 75 questions, 75 multiple choice questions. Um, so it would be a lengthier uh, uh, you know, assessment. Uh, so which is why my hope is that by the by the weekend, I will be able to post it. Uh, you know, I'm uh, trying my best to do that. Uh, so we would have up to today's class in the portion. OK, so uh, we did a few chapters of John's gospel uh, you know, for the first assessment. So wherever we stopped from that chapter onwards up to uh, what we are doing today uh, would be the portion for the second assessment. Uh, there would be 75 multiple choice questions. Uh, so you would need to tick the correct one. And um, you will at least, I think, get 10 days uh, you know, to finish it. Uh, if not a little more, because 25th is the um, last date. Yeah, right. 25th, November 25th would be the last date. Uh, so for those who would be looking at this video later on e-platform, uh, the link closes on November 25th, and there is no way of resetting it. Uh, so um, you know, those of you who are you know doing this course through the e-platform, please make sure you know that you uh, you know finish. Um, both of the assessments by November 25th, because there cannot be any extension after that. And um, if you want a certificate for this particular course, you would have to do it all over again, you know, in case these um, assessments are not finished off. So uh, this is just for the uh, e-platform students. Um, maybe the Google students could be shown a little grace, but uh, it would be good if you can, you know, finish on time as well. All right, so yes, uh, let's get into uh, first John. Uh, so if we could have maybe one person read out verses one and two of the letter, uh, we can start. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's, um, okay. Asha has a question. Go ahead. Yeah. No, you don't have a question. Okay. Fine. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. If someone could read out verses one and two. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life is made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Yes. Uh, so we see a similarity between the opening uh, you know, wording of John's Gospel and the opening wording over here, 
uh, both of them talking about the beginning. Uh, but there is a slight difference. Um, in the John's Gospel, when we looked at the term in the beginning, there John was uh, talking about even before creation. And the point that he was trying to make over there was that the word, which is Jesus, uh, was there from the very beginning, even before creation. Uh, that was the point that he was trying to get across over there. Uh, here, when he's talking about uh, from the beginning, uh, he's referring over here to the uh, word of life, which is being discussed here. And he wants to convey the fact that this word of life was in Jesus from the very beginning. Uh, the word of life is um, is has been incarnated, has been you know brought into human form, um, uh, has been embodied in Jesus. So um, the difference between the Gospel of John, uh, Gospel of John's opening and the opening over here uh, is that while in the Gospel of John, in the beginning referred to Jesus being there even before creation. And the emphasis over there was, uh, you know, who is Jesus? Jesus is someone who was with God and was God from the very beginning. So the entire emphasis in the prologue of the Gospel of John was Jesus. Who is Jesus? That was being established. Over here, um, the main thing that is being established is who is the word? What is the word? And uh, so, the word is not just a bunch of um, you know um, alphabets put together. Uh, rather, the word is a person, uh, and uh, so the word was incarnated in Jesus from the very beginning. So uh, the emphasis over here is on the word. Okay, so this would be the main difference which you would kind of need to know uh, regarding the preface of this epistle and the preface of John's gospel. Um, so moving on to this word of life, um, you know, just for us to get a um, you know perspective, uh, why is the emphasis over here in the epistle about uh, the word of life, and why was there an emphasis earlier about Jesus? That's because you see, when uh, John's gospel was written at that time, uh, you know, uh, he and the other believers were still dealing with the uh, Jewish people, the Jewish leaders and uh, many of whom were fighting the truth, fighting the fact that uh, Jesus is from God. And so uh, in, in John's gospel, uh, his attempt, you know, his main attempt is trying to establish very clearly the fact that Jesus is divine, that he is from God, uh, that he must be worshipped as God. So that was the main emphasis. So uh, in, in John's gospel, the emphasis is, uh, is on trying to, uh, you know, point out who Jesus is, uh, what capacity he occupies, and all of that. Here, uh, the times have changed because uh, these letters are being at a, at a uh, being written at a uh, later period. And uh, so, over here in uh, in the first uh, epistle, mm, the people are bringing in. There are people who are bringing in false doctrines. So here, he wants to emphasize that the word of God is not changed. From the time of Jesus, when Jesus came as word incarnate, you know, in human form, uh, literally embodying the word in human form, uh, from that time, the word has not changed. So now, even though false teachings are coming in, hold on to what was taught to you right in the beginning, what you have, you know, and he talks about how they have seen the word, how they have touched the word, you know, they have lived with the word. And uh, so he is the correct word. And all these new doctrines that are coming in are uh, false. So uh, here, the emphasis is on the word, uh, because it is this word that the believers need to hold on to so that they are not deceived and led away. Okay, So that would be the um, you know contrast that we see. And uh, so here in verse 2, there's something very nice that, uh, you know, uh, that John says. Um, he says, the life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it, you know, because they literally lived with the uh, uh, with with the life who came. Uh, he came in human form, so they interacted with him. They saw him. Uh, they were with him, and and it says we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. 
so here not only is the word being spoken of as um as um jesus eternal life is also being spoken of as jesus as a person uh, so eternal life is not just a concept it's a person and uh, this i think is very key for us to grasp um because eternal life is all about relationship fellowship with this person eternal life is not a product that you you know that you acquire that you take in your hand and you know put in your pocket no it is a living person so eternal life is you having a relationship with this uh, with this jesus who is the eternal life um, so uh, this kind of um, you know helps us to separate the true believers from those who have just simply said a salvation prayer because they wanted a ticket to heaven uh, so you see it, it immediately brings in a, um, a divide between the two categories there are people who have said the salvation prayer not because they cared about jesus or because they loved him or felt grateful to him for, for what he had done no they said the salvation prayer because they wanted to purchase something okay it was not being purchased it was being given free but they wanted to acquire it and so they have said the salvation prayer simply to get their heaven ticket and but eternal life is not a heaven ticket eternal life is a person it's a relationship so those who have not genuinely made that commitment are under the impression that they have been saved but there has been no salvation experience there has been no transformation on the inside because they did not reach out to a person and say now i am submitting to you and i want to have a relationship with you i want to um, you know your life uh, to flow into mine and i want to be changed and transformed so all those events have not occurred and uh, so over here in verse 2 it is so clearly established we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the father and has appeared to us so here it has been made very clear that eternal life is a relationship with jesus it's not just uh, you saying you know uh, you know thank you for what you did on the cross and i th i think i would like to have my ticket uh, it's not at all that uh, so we would kind of you know need to re uh, remember that and yes uh, we have uh, charles who has raised his hand uh, please go ahead brother yeah Did you allow me to ask the question, Pastor? Go ahead, please. Yes. All right. Um, I am I am responding to the fact that someone who makes a, a, a prayer of salvation when mm -hmm. they have no they are not going to experience transformation. Mm -hmm. Would such people go to heaven? Well, salvation is only through jesus through his cleansing work his uh, work of atonement and uh, for that you would first need to abide in him right you come into him he is you are like this branch which is getting attached to the vine uh, so when you make that commitment uh, you get attached to the vine and his life flows into you uh, so you and i uh, we become uh, living beings in the sense now we have you know eternal life in us uh, so if there is no relationship and you're still like a branch which is you know still standing apart and all you're saying is you know give me my ticket to heaven you have not really abided in him so this is all about relationship uh, this whole um, you know life that we have as believers it's all about being connected to him and being a part of him um, and in fact he says apart from me you can do nothing so maybe we could even say you no know, you can be nothing in the sense you you have no eternal life in you so yes uh, people who are kind of doing this um, in in a way it's not really their fault it's what they have been taught they they are told you know you are a sinner you have sinned now if you say the salvation prayer then jesus is going to forgive you and once you're forgiven you know you 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 have a way to heaven now there are some who would have said that prayer with repentance in their heart they would have said it say you know really um, ashamed of their past and now they know that there is hope in him so they are coming to him saying lord you know be my savior i really want my life changed now uh, 
uh, they may not fully you know know all the details of what is involved in salvation but the attitude is right they are reaching out to him because they want his work in their life and he will never turn away anyone who comes to him you know with that attitude in their heart so they may not have that all the right words in their mouth they may in fact not even know all the details of what they are doing but one thing they know um they, they are, that if they reach out to him he will be their savior he will change them uh, in now in him they are going to be made righteous and they're going to get a second chance to live uh, the way we are meant to live uh, you know so they have at least understood that much on the other hand someone who's just coming and saying oh this is really nice all i need to do is say a prayer and i get to go to heaven this is a really good deal but there has been no commitment made on the inside so in a way that person has chosen not to be attached to the wine so no there would be no salvation so um, from the outside we will not be able to judge at all when we have two people standing in front of us at the altar call and they are saying the salvation prayer we will in no way know and it would be probably be very dangerous for us to even point fingers and judge but the only the lord knows the work that has happened on the inside has there been a connection if there is a connection now they are part of his family on the other hand if they have chosen not to connect then no god will just continue speaking to them you know motivating them urging them so maybe some day down the line they will realize that oh you know i need to make this personal commitment to him and they'll actually do it so um for some when they say the salvation prayer it is a genuine experience for some uh maybe at that point of time they have not really understood the facts but gradually maybe they'll get to know that oh okay i'm actually meant to live with this jesus and make a commitment to him and they would do that sometime later i suppose and yes at that point of time they would come into his family into his fold and uh, yes then they would be able to go to heaven i hope that kind of clarifies it does that help uh, charles yes perfect ah uh, yeah um so uh, let's move on from there uh, yeah he he says um yeah verse 3 All right. If someone could read out verse three. Vastly, it says that that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed. our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ amen yes so here uh, this a uh, point that uh, john is very specifically making he says um, you know we are giving you this facts so that you can believe in this embodied word in this jesus because then you will be able to have fellowship with us um, because those who are now beginning to get you know uh, drawn away by the wrong doctrines they are going to be having fellowship with the um, with the followers of the wrong doctrines rather than having fellowship with john and the other true believers and um, fellowship over here implies not just simply you know uh, sitting with them uh, sitting with the, with that particular group but it would automatically mean you know the works which they are doing you also would do because fellowship always involves uh, more than just being with a group you would automatically begin to think like them uh, your choices would be made uh, you know uh, in accordance with the choices that they are making so your entire world view your perspective it's it's all going to undergo a change you will be like the group that you are fellowshipping with and um, so over here he says you know the, we are trying to give you the truth i am uh, writing this letter to give you the truth so that you may continue to have fellowship with us and not with them okay so he's um, you know um, drawing a clear divide between the true believers and these fake christians who are calling themselves believers so he says you know we are revealing the truth to you so that you can have fellowship with us because when you have fellowship with us our fellowship is something very superior it's not just fellowship with a bunch of human beings 
our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ and when you have fellowship with the father and with jesus christ and with us your joy will be complete so that is the reason why i'm writing this letter so you know he's urging them to take the letter seriously so that their joy can be complete um so throughout this letter um we have to keep in mind that he's addressing a very dangerous issue that is creeping into the church and he wants to take a very firm stand against it and make it very very clear that what was revealed by the word incarnate um you know what the words which came out of jesus from mouth in the beginning those are the truth what is now coming in these things which people are now bringing in uh, those are false so uh, just to very quickly touch upon the three wrong teachings that were prevailing in john's church at that time uh, we did cover this in the introduction uh, but then you know it's been like two weeks now uh, so um, the first was um, the docetists the docetists were the uh, people uh, who said that jesus looked human uh but he was not actually fully human he was like the old testament angel of the lord the angel of the lord would appear to people in human form but he was not really human he appeared that way but in reality he was fully divine so they said jesus was something like that he never was fully human is what uh, the docetists said uh, because the docetists the serenthians um and the ones who were into the you know the gnosticism proper all the three categories of people were gnostics in 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 one sense or the other and for the gnostics um you know that would be g n o s t i c s the gnostics um for all the three categories of uh, of these gnostics their main basic belief is was that uh, matter is evil matter is impure so the matter including the flesh the human body uh, it's impure how can god become something impure by putting on a you no know, impure matter and becoming a human was their thing so the docetist gnostics would basically say that no 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 jesus was never fully human he would never lower himself to um, becoming something that is impure matter uh, the serenthian um, gnostics on the other hand uh they were they were focusing on another aspect of narcissism where you would need to have some kind of divine experience a kind of divine knowledge which comes upon you so they would say ah jesus was a normal human being he was born to mary and uh, joseph um there was nothing uh, supernatural about his birth but on the day of baptism the spirit of christ came upon him so that was the divine experience which which made him divine temporarily because while he was hanging on the cross the spirit of christ left him and went away so for a temporary period of time he was divine so um, uh, so the serenthians focus on that aspect of gnosticism where um, where you have a very mystical experience which comes upon you and your mind is opened and you get to know things which no other people know and that would lead to your salvation Uh, so that would what that was what the serenthians were saying the gnostics proper who were you know deeply into that whole um, doctrine um, they said uh, that only one small set group of people specially chosen by god they are the ones uh, who would have this kind of um, uh, very uh, deep uh, you know experience where uh, something would happen to them and uh, god would start revealing mysteries to them which nobody else knows and so they basically looked down upon the church they looked down on all the believers and said you know you people are not that special chosen few you know you uh, you you do not know the things that have been revealed to us and so they said come join our group then maybe you too will have one of those experiences and then if you do then you will become part of the chosen ones and so they uh, they they presented themselves like as if they are they are elite you know and there's something there's something special about them and uh, like as if the, all the others are um, holding on to outdated knowledge yeah, so uh, you know so so these were the and uh, so these three kind of was making sense to these poor believers and they were getting led astray and uh, so john in his letter almost everything that he writes over here he is targeting this he's trying to put a close to this kind of wrong doctrine that is going around 
just another point that we could maybe bring out from this particular you know verse uh, before we move on um he says and our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ now john usually both in his gospel and over here in this epistle um wherever he uses the word son uh, for jesus christ he uses one particular greek word called huios okay that would be h u i o s okay so wherever he tries to use the word son for jesus specifically he uses the greek word h u i o s but on the other hand wherever he's trying to use the word son for you know believers he uses a different word technon okay t e k uh, n o n so um throughout his gospel and his epistles he talks about technon and he talks about vios so wherever he's talking about vios he's referring specifically to jesus christ on the other hand wherever he uses the term technon uh, and in some places he uses also the word paideia okay so um in these places he's talking so he makes a differentiation between um the son of god the divine one and the sons of god who are the family of the lord okay so he makes this differentiation on the other hand uh, it's interesting to note that paul makes no such differentiation um he very freely calls even uh, the believers also vios so i'm not particularly sure why um you know this this distinction i'm assuming it's because john was worried that the people would take the word vios and again bring some new doctrine out of it saying that no we are also divine just like him or something like that so maybe that is why he was very very careful even though jesus is the son and we too are sons of god um he tries to keep the two words separate on the other hand paul does not make any such distinctions and he freely uses the word vios for both the um, both the son of god and also for all of the believers you know romans 8:14 would be one example there are of course many many places where he uses the word vios very freely uh, so in romans 8:14 paul says for those who are led by the spirit of god are the vios of god they are the children of god so he uses the same word which is generally used for the son of god um uh, yeah mm, so uh, uh, the first four verses that we saw uh, in this epistle they are called the uh, preface or the prologue i mean they are like, like the introduction where uh, john has presented the word of life the original word of life you know which was incarnated in jesus and who stood among them and spoke he says that is the true word of god hold on to that don't get led astray so that that is basically the content of your first four verses which are your prologue now verse 5 onwards um he starts talking about you know people who claim that they know god what are some of the things that you see in their lives so if you don't see those things in their lives then it means that they are fake christians okay so uh, verse 5 up to chapter 2 verse 2 okay so from 15 up to 22 uh, you could say uh, it's talking about um how you can test the people who say that they know god by testing their attitude towards sin so in this uh, passage which we will be going into 15 up to 22 um one way that you can test the claim that people are making that they are believers you would need to test their attitude towards sin so let's actually get into that um if someone could read out verses 5 to 7 Yes. One John, chapter one, verse five to seven. Yes, this please. Is, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light. we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son cleanses us from all sin amen yes uh just one thing that we can note before we get into the actual content of this passage um if you see in verse 5 it says um and declare to you god is light 
okay and in verse 7 it says uh, that god uh, is in the light so there are two statements one that god is light and the other that god is in the light so the first of of course is talking about his character god is light there is no darkness at all in him there's nothing dark about him nothing that is uh, that needs to be hidden he is completely all light that would be his character now when it comes to verse 7 and it says that he is in the light it's talking more about his actions his deeds uh, what he does uh, what he says so over here um, uh, when it says he is in the light it's talking more about uh, what he does as a person his actions and his words okay so that's just the um, basic difference between god is light and god is in the light now coming to the uh, the content of this passage which you know which 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 was just read out um if you notice in verse 6 it says if we claim to have fellowship with god and yet walk in the darkness then we are lying on the other hand if we walk in the light you know how would you complete the sentence uh, we are saying fellowship with god um uh, you know walk yeah okay uh, if you walk in the darkness uh, you don't have fellowship with god on the other hand if you walk in the light the you know you would probably fill up the blank and say you would have fellowship with god but he doesn't say that uh, he says you will be have fellowship with one another okay so in verse 6 it says you walk in darkness you don't have fellowship with god next verse you walk in light and we would assume that he will say you will have fellowship with god but he says you will have we will have fellowship with one another so you know this is just like what um, i had said earlier um he's trying to bring out the fact that people who are claim that they have fellowship with god and are refusing to fellowship with the other believers because they think they're superior to them he says in what sense are you true believers because you seem to be thinking that you can form an exclusive club and say that you people are the only chosen ones with some kind of hidden knowledge and you're refusing to fellowship with the other believers and yet you say that you're walking in the light that cannot be because a person who is walking in the light they will have fellowship with all the believers but you people who hold on to the false doctrine are not doing this so very clearly he brings out the point over here that um people who are claiming to have fellowship with him uh, but are refusing to have fellowship with the other believers it shows that they are very much walking in the darkness and not in the light because people who are in the light will have fellowship with one another it kind of makes us think about our own interactions with other believers um how are our interactions with other people uh, because for god that is very vital very important how we relate with the rest of the uh, family of god um so if we are walking in ways that are um hurting other people uh, that are you know not building up other people then we are imitating the people who walk in darkness and uh, that would not be something that would please the lord so we have to be very careful to act like people who are walking in the light and make sure that we have good fellowship with all the with all the rest of the family of god even um, during times when we don't quite agree with them even during times when um, it it's difficult uh, to be to show love and you know show kindness to someone who is who is not treating us very well so um, we see this point coming across uh, so the first thing that we we the first result of walking the light is that we will have fellowship with all the believers uh, the second um, result of walking in the light is that we will be uh, purified from our sins by the blood of jesus um so here the wording says um but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son purifies us from all sin okay so wherever you have the term the blood of jesus purifies us uh, it's talking about the work which jesus did on the cross that entire crucifixion process that he went through as a result of which we now have cleansing because of which we now have atonement um because this um it's rather harmless i'm mean, um, in fact wondering whether i should even touch upon this point or not 
but just so that you know we would have more clarity in our minds about what we are doing um there are people who go around applying the blood of jesus to everything in sight you know um i apply the blood of jesus to my home i apply the blood of jesus to my vehicle um and you know i you know you just the blood of jesus is not some kind of holy water or some kind of um, i mean an anointed liquid that you go around sprinkling about uh, like as if you're doing some kind of a ritual what you're actually talking about when you say that blood of jesus uh, you're talking about what jesus did on the cross and you're consciously understanding and saying oh because of what jesus did on the cross my home is safe because of the work of jesus on the cross uh, you know i can take my vehicle and go out on the roads and i will not have an accident because the lord uh, i'm part of his covenant he will watch over me so we are consciously dwelling upon those aspects of the blood those aspects of the work on the cross which was done and completed and being fully aware of that we are declaring that over our lives so just simply reducing the blood of jesus to some kind of magical substance which you you know just kind of randomly keep applying to everything that that thing does not quite make sense now people who do that have nothing bad in their hearts um they genuinely believe in the power of uh, the work of the you know the finished work of on the cross so i think god does not hold it against us when we do that but it helps us to know what on earth we are talking about when i when we say you know i'm applying the blood to this i'm applying the blood to that you are actually talking about what he has done on the cross and you are saying because of what he has done on the cross i know that this this portion of my life is secure is secure is under his protection so it would be it would help for us to have clarity on what we are saying rather than kind of doing it uh, like an empty ritual um yeah because then it gains meaning and then satan cannot take advantage of us because we can declare and say you know what this aspect of my life i have brought it under the blood of jesus i have brought it under the divine work which he did so because of the work which he has done now you can't meddle and do your works in this area of my life i cancel those works because i stand on what jesus has done through his blood for this aspect of my life so you know it, you even you do it consciously um this greater power and uh, satan will not be play will not will not be able to play with us uh, so um rather than the innocent believer who just you know just simply says you know i apply the blood to this I apply the blood to that okay so it it helps us to be to be conscious about what we are saying and to understand what we are uh, saying uh yeah we have uh, uh, two hands being raised uh, yes um, uh, we have time yes we do have time please go ahead yeah um um maybe we can have charles because his name is showing first uh, yeah if you could ask your question or okay he has not raised a hand then in that case uh, brother shay your name is next on my screen uh, so thank would you. you like to go ahead yeah yes pa yes pastor thank you very much um and thank you for bringing this up um i, I think it's it, it was good you brought uh, brought it up but well, i just also like to gain clarity um on what you just said about um uh, people ignorantly um and i say this with caution um ignorantly just applying the blood of jesus to every single thing um and maybe again it could be because uh, this has been passed down over the years we have seen maybe our four parents doing this and we've seen it and people just blindly and ignorantly continue uh, but in another light could it be that um the reason why people do it is that it's in the similitude of what the israelites um were instructed to do when M moses got the instruction from god to apply the blood of the lamb up, uh, on the lintel of their door. And by that, the angel of death will pass over. And if that alone from the blood of an animal could prevent the Israelites from being killed, how much more the blood of Jesus Christ? 
So I'm thinking in my mind, I, I totally agree with what you just said, but I'm thinking in my mind, could it be that that was the basis? Because at the end of the day, even when we look at the Old Testament, we see that many things are pointed to Jesus Christ. You know, the way they even place the blood on the post of the door, it kind of signifies the cross of Jesus Christ, right? So could it be that that was the basis for why people, you know, would always apply the blood of Jesus to every single thing, their house, their car, you know, over their kids, over their children, just so that they're within the safety of the Lord. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you could just give more clarity on it. Or are we just supposed to look at the blood of Jesus Christ in, in the sense whereby we only strictly just see it as the washing power of our sins? Or could there be more potential to the blood of Jesus Christ, but we need to do it with understanding and knowledge? Uh, just maybe I'm asking yes. for more clarity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um we have three minutes left, but then you know, we can maybe take another extra one or two minutes. Um, so the blood of Jesus does not uh, symbolize only the washing and cleansing aspect, um, because the blood of Jesus also uh, you know, represents other parts of what he did on the cross. So it was not just the cleansing which he did. He also won victory for us you know, uh, with regard to uh, sin. He helped us gain victory over sickness. So um, when we say blood of Jesus, we are not talking about just the cleansing and the purification part of the work that was done. There were other aspects of the work also which were done uh, because of his work on the cross. Now I can have uh, victory over sin. I don't need to you know, always live as a slave to sin. Uh, I can have a victorious life. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, I can claim healing for myself and for my family members. So um, uh, fully knowing all the things that the, that the blood of Jesus has accomplished on the cross for me, the, the entire full list of all that it, you know he has achieved for me, uh, the, the covenant promises which are all mine now because he shed his blood. Uh, you know, he won those things for us. Uh, earlier, only Abraham and his descendants uh, had a right to those things. But now I have a right to all and access to all of those things because of the work which was done on the cross. Um, and, uh, um, you know, Paul says, all the spiritual riches in heaven are now ours. Uh, so that is also because of um, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So, um, um, you know, maybe you could actually write down an entire list of all the things uh, which are now ours because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So the blood of Christ represents all of those things. Um, and so we want to apply all of those things to our family members. We want to apply it to our home and our possessions so that none of them are, you know, fall into danger. Um, in the Old Testament, they actually used the physical blood of an animal and um, it was symbolic. Uh, they would apply it uh, to the doorpost on, uh, at least on that particular occasion. Uh, they were allowed to apply to the doorpost and the angel of death passed over. Uh, but after that, um, the blood was never allowed to be used as a, some kind of talisman, you know, to keep away harm and danger. Uh, um, they were never encouraged to use it in that manner afterwards. It was only ever used by the priest in a symbolic sense where he would sprinkle it as symbolism of cleansing and purification. Uh, but they were never allowed to go around because especially back then in those times when you had all these pagan rituals going around, um, the they. God, Yahweh would have been very careful not to encourage his people to start using, you know, animal blood as some kind of a thing which holds divine properties and to go around sprinkling, sprinkling it all over the place. So no, even then it was um, something which only the priests would ever do and they would sprinkle it, uh, you know, once in a year inside the Holy of Holies um, to symbolize the atonement work. And also they would uh, you know, uh, sprinkle it uh, on the other objects which are there in the holy place and all of that. Uh, so it was more to do with the sanctification and uh, not to guard you from any danger. Uh, so coming to what we actually do in our homes and our families, um, 
it's like uh, people who you know uh, i know many people personally uh, who keep a bible under their pillow when they sleep uh, because the idea is that if you have a um, bible under your pillow uh, you'll get good dreams and you'll get good rest um, now uh, satan knows that that book under your bed is not really going to make much of a difference uh, but if that kind of helps you and um, god still sees that you know that that is your level of um, growth in in spiritual knowledge at that level he may actually you know you know support you in that and actually help you to get good dreams and and get good rest because you're still uh, learning these things and you're still growing and the lord is all right no my child is trusting me in his own way he's put that bible over there because he believes that if he puts that bible over there you know i am going to protect him so but then at some point of time we'll have to outgrow those childish things and we would have to understand what we are doing so when we uh, go around saying i'm applying the blood to my children I'm applying the blood to my home uh, if we are still at that um, young level we are maybe we are still learning the truths that's totally fine i'm assuming because god would say um, yeah you know these people are trusting in me but on the other hand um, uh, satan can still you know meddle with our home and meddle with our uh, you know the lives of our children and create damage um, uh, however if we are aware of all that the blood stands for and say this is the finished work of the cross uh, on on the cross for my children and so you know satan you have no right to harm my children and you declare it knowing fully what you are saying now that satan cannot fight against uh, so innocent um, you know rituals i think god is okay with it and he even, even backs you up to an extent uh, but doing it fully knowing and doing it like a mature adult and declaring that would be actual spiritual warfare because you know by the testimony uh, you know and by the blood that is what it, uh, it it's talking about when it talks about how they won their victory by the testimony of their you know the words that they speak out the declaration they make regarding the finished work and the actual work of the cross which is backing it up backing up those words that is how victory is won so it would always help for us to have to consciously do it rather than you know just doing it more like a um, innocent ritual i yeah uh, yes okay, uh, it, does does that help thank you thank you pastor I, I, yes. I just had i had another question but maybe we after yeah the after break, the break uh, yes. so now it's uh, 54 so in that case uh, shall we get back at 104 all right so 104 uh, we will resume our class 10-4. All right. Thank you.